Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Construction Project Management Principles. I'm a professor of construction management and I love doing YouTube videos. I hope you'll join me in learning about all things construction. Today's topic, we're going to be diving into a little bit about the critical path. Now I've talked about the critical path, how it's calculated and different things before, and you can check my playlist for some of the videos on those types of topics. I'm going to discuss the fundamentals of the critical path today, but I also want to dive in a little bit to the limitations on the critical path. And I want to have a little bit of fun today. Um, I thought we could talk a little bit about Kodak, Polaroid, Apple, and cameras based on a recent Founders uh, podcast that I was listening to um, regarding Edwin Land. And so we'll get into that a little bit, but usually there's these things in life and in other businesses that make strong connections that really reinforce why something might be not working as well as it could in our sector or our industry, meaning the construction industry. So let's get started and start thinking about some of these fundamentals and their applications. And perhaps that'll tie with some of the issues that you have on some of your projects. And if you have any issues you want to comment on, feel free to uh, put them in the comments section below so that we can all learn and share information together in our construction community here. All right, so the critical path. Simply put, it's the longest path through the network of activities that we have. All right, so in the network of activities are all the activities we feel we need to document, that we need to sequence to figure out what we need to do next, when we need to do it, to get it into a schedule, what's dependent on something getting done so that we can do something, so it's including schedule logic and all of those aspects. And when we put them together really, really well, like we see up on our screen over here, you'll have a sequence that actually will give you start dates and finish dates. Uh, you'll have to have the duration for all of the activities. Uh, when you know that this finishes, you'll know what comes next. And you'll set out milestones, which are key points in time that you're striving towards. Uh, and that should give you a complete time frame for what these activities need to take. So, you know, it's a complete network of activities. It's the longest path through the network. So it's really counting those ones that are red because these ones, they would have what you would call float, flexibility. This could take a little bit longer and not delay the project. If this takes longer, something on the critical path takes longer, unless you do something about it, it's going to make your project take longer. So that sequencing is really important from that um, framework. And so when we have it all together, really this is what we're saying is, well, this is the best way to run our project. And if we run it this way, it's gonna give us the shortest overall time to complete the project if we do everything correctly. So it's very helpful that way because you can imagine you've got this big project and you're thinking, okay, uh, where do I start? And you start by breaking it down and we, we get into those topics in other videos, a work breakdown structure and breaking those components into further components and we've got these activities and we're figuring out durations and sequencing. So it's got a lot of advantages to doing that. And don't worry, we're gonna talk about disadvantages too because I'm also a proponent of lean construction methodology and lean construction methodology is a methodology that's not such a huge fan of the critical path, but then there's some things that I also, nuances that I like people to think about, because I don't think the critical path is all bad, but I don't think it's all good either. So then it, the question is, well, how can we more effectively run our projects? Because we do have a lot of issues in the construction industry with keeping to timeframes, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So advantages, helps to come up with we weekly key phase milestone and finish dates. How would you know where your milestones are if you didn't have a critical path? You know, if you didn't develop that schedule, how would you know where key phase dates or milestone dates should be that you can target? You need a benchmark to target. <clears throat> it was Eisenhower that said that um, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. And so, yes, we have to be able to plan and replan and adjust. And so what he meant by that is that things are not going to go exactly the way we thought. And so that's one of the hiccups I think people get into with 
critical path planning. They think that they're going to get all of the details and the sequencing and information, especially the less experience you have, and that things are going to go exactly like clockwork. And in this VUCA world that we live in, with the volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity that goes on, that's very, 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 very unlikely. But that's okay, as long as we know that and we're making that part of our processes and systems, and we're developing processes and systems that accept that. So a project team can prioritize their work based on the CPM. Well, that simply means if you know which activities are critical and you know which activities are not, and you've got limited time like we all do, we're stretched for time, then if something is going a little bit out of whack on a non-critical activity, you're not going to pay as much attention to that as if something on the critical path is going out of whack. Because for certain, that one that's going out of whack is going to delay your project, whereas the other one, it won't delay your project until it becomes critical. At some point, if it becomes critical, then it's, it's critical and then that's prioritized. Uh, but that also helps to reduce your stress level because not everything is critical on your project. So knowing the difference can be very, very helpful in you better managing your time. You can easily run sensitivity analysis. So you, those of you that watch my channel know I do a lot of videos on Microsoft Project. And one of the huge advantages is you can see, well, if this happens, this is the repercussions, right? Or when you update, you can see, oh, this is putting us behind schedule. And you can run different scenarios virtually to determine what's the best attack or approach on what's going on in your project. So that can be very helpful. So it can obviously be updated to reflect changes. So you can update the schedule and you can see changes as they are happening. I'm going to come back to that though because there's some, some time frame differences that causes some real issues there. All right. Uh, provides a baseline benchmark to measure against. We need something. That's why Eisen plans are nothing, but planning is everything. But we need that plan so that we can measure against what are we trying to accomplish. And we can see how we're doing on that pathway. Doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have taken the exact pathway, but it does mean that when things are happening, we're seeing how far off the pathway are we going, right? And what are the overall goals and objectives that we are after? I was reading a biography recently and there was you know, a lot of information about D-Day in World War II and how things, a lot of things didn't go as planned. Uh, you know, they were supposed to land in certain villages, paratroopers and different things, and they were off the mark and they landed in different villages. But if they looked at their overall goals of what they were trying to achieve, it was going very well. So you got to look at, well, what are we trying to achieve here? And so in construction, a lot of times, it's not that we went exactly that way, but if we can get to where we wanted to be by a certain date, a milestone date as an example, then we're well on our way to achieving the goals that we're after. Time, cost, quality, scope, all of those things fit in there. So it does give us that baseline to measure, measure against, and it gives us some confidence because we kind of know whereabouts we are in that process. All right, so that's great, advantages, but disadvantages. Um, one of the, the shortcomings is, well, I could have somebody sit down and develop this critical path schedule, and if they're not really getting valuable inputs from very, very experienced people, then garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, so that's, that's a major issue. Uh, so that could then, we've got this nice schedule, but that could give you a false sense of, car, uh, of confidence when the data you have in it, not all that great. Um, you can make mistakes on schedules. And one of the disadvantages too is using a scheduling software. Somebody on, on my, uh, my, one of my Microsoft project videos was making a comment about Primavera being better and this and that. Honestly, uh, I, I don't really care the software. I care about the data that's in the software. But if you, it is true, if you feel that one software you're making more mistakes with than another software or that that's possible, then you wanna go with the software that's gonna give you the best information. 
And some software, quite honestly, requires very, very skilled people to input the information, right? I think, as an example, Primavera is a great program. I think it's a great enterprise program, but you better have a professional scheduler that's entering the information and managing that information. And that takes it one less step, one more step, actually, further from the project, the people that are at the front lines. And so I, myself, I like to have a strong connection between the people at the front lines and whoever's working with the schedules, right? And so it can be done. It just has to be done very collaboratively. Otherwise, um, you get schedulers that are inputting information that may not be totally accurate or something gets lost in the translation of somebody providing that data to the scheduler. So it needs to be entered correctly. It, you know, any project that you don't have a clear scope, well, again, it's not, it's not going to be that good, but uh, CPM on the aspect of changes, at least you've got what it was before the changes or the scope. Uh, and you got to change it as you're going and then you can see the impact of the changes. So that's a good thing in that way. Uh, but if you don't really have uh, the information, like you sh it should be that it's everybody is reviewing this. It's not like you've got two sets of books. This is the critical path we're using, but this is what we're showing to our trades. That's not very transparent and trades figure this stuff out anyways. And then they're even less wanting to collaborate because you, they figure that you're always trying to hide something. Uh, falls out of date quickly. This happens, right? So just like D-Day, just like Eisenhower, uh, you know, with the plans, they fall out of date quickly. So we've got to have a system that we can update them quickly. And to update a whole critical path schedule, like on a daily and weekly basis, is a lot of work. So most often in construction, there there's a formal update, usually contractually, that's provided to the client once a month. Like, again, contracts can be different. Maybe it's done internally twice a month, but it's not generally done more than that. But even then, it's not even that often twice a month. So that means that, you know, you're looking at something that's three or four weeks old, what's been going on in the meantime? And so the data, the feedback that you're getting is kind of lagging. And in construction and in anything, as I'll point out, you want to have very, very quick feedback loops. Now, on the long term, because a lot of construction projects are months, years, right? We've got this LRT in Toronto, light rail transit system that's going on, and it's already going on 13 years, right? That's a long period of time. Uh, but projects can be construction projects. If you're in renovations and that, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be several years. So for a CPM, it's very good at seeing how are we progressing overall on the long term. And I mentioned this to my students, you know, I, I say, well, when you come into a four year degree program, before you came in, you knew what courses you had to take and which semesters they would be in. It's just basically in a course listing. But something that's coming in fourth year, you don't know when the tests are or the assignments are for something that's in fourth year. You do know the first day pretty much or the first week when you go to your classes, which courses you're taking, what the schedule is for them, and when the major assignments, tests, and exams are. So that gives you now a lot clearer picture than say something in the fourth year. So the level of detail when you get closer can go up. And so this is what you have to understand with a critical path schedule. There is no way that you have that level of detail on a four-year project when you plan out that critical path schedule. Now, you may be able to encompass the time periods and higher levels of the work in the activities, and partly from historical data, partly from experience, partly from tracking other previous projects really well, and inputs of various uh, skilled tradespeople, companies that you're dealing with and vendors in inputting that, yes. But you don't have the real detail till you get closer to the work. So that's where you got to know critical paths not going to help you for that. So as you get closer, you need other mechanisms. 
So if we're in traditional construction, the other mechanisms are typically going to be um, what we call short-term schedules or look-ahead schedules. In lean construction, we have a milestone schedule, which we call a phase schedule, we, where we pull the milestones off of a critical path master schedule, preferably developed with a lot of inputs with the trades. And again, contract models and other things all influence that. And then from that milestone schedule, and I'm not gonna get into it here, we do like a pull plan where we gather the trades and everybody collaborates together to kind of get that, okay, that milestone's gonna be three months to get that back to where we're starting the milestone and making sure that that works. And then we're taking that and we're looking at six weeks and we call it a make ready, which in regular construction, you could say, okay, well, we're gonna have a short-term schedule that's six weeks. Wouldn't have done the pull plan, but we could do that. As long as you're getting a lot of collaboration, a lot of inputs, it'll have more detail than a lot more detail than your master schedule. And it'll be a lot more accurate too. And then you're working to get it closer to one week, what are we doing in the next week? We've got the six week, what's the first week of that six weeks? What do we have to do? You should have really good clarity on that. If I ask you, and you think about it right now, what are you doing in this upcoming week? In my mind, I have a really good, I have really good clarity on what I need to do in this upcoming week. I can go to my Google calendar and I can see how I've got certain things laid out. Uh, but on a project, construction project, you gotta have the trades, everybody lined up and those inputs and making sure that they, the deliveries are coordinated, the trades are coordinated, we don't have overstacking in certain areas so that the project can run efficiently. And then even on a daily basis, we're looking for very quick feedback, very quick feedback. How did it go? What, what do we need to adjust? How can we pivot? So this is really, really something that I think people don't see that, don't maybe teach that, or don't really think about it on construction projects. If you talk to site supers, they're not huge typical fans of a critical path. You talk about somebody involved with lean construction, not because they know those changes are gonna take place. Now, I still think the critical path is important in laying out that overall project and getting those milestones done. And I also still think updating it and seeing how it's affecting the overall project is important, but it is not everything it is only part of that. We've got to be thinking about quicker feedback. It's a longer feedback mechanism. How do we get shorter um, feedback? And so this was where I was listening to a Founders podcast. And if you, did, you know, if you listen to podcasts and you haven't listened to Founders podcasts, I strongly recommend that you do. It's all about founders of companies. Everyone from, it's on the biographies. So generally it's on books, biographies, people like Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, uh, Edison, um, Steve Jobs. Uh, in this case, Edwin Lan. Duh. He uh, basically is a founder of Polaroid. And so, you know, if you're, if you're under 40, you probably never heard of Polaroid. Uh, but it, when I was a kid, it was a pretty um, big thing. And everybody's kind of heard of Kodak. And of course, everybody knows our friends at Apple. And I was watching this uh, or listening to this podcast and it was talking about Edwin Land. And um, basically this camera here, I had when I was about, mm, I'm gonna say about 15 or 16. And so this was a, uh, what they called the land camera after Edwin Land. And what it did was you would click a button and it would take a picture and then out the, out the front would come this basically doubled sheet of plastic. And you'd wait a minute and then you could peel it open and there was your picture photograph it was there it was like magic now he developed that technology going back probably about 20 years or so before that uh kodak you know kodak was always you take a picture take another picture take another picture take another picture shoot a roll you shoot the whole roll and sometimes maybe it would take you a few weeks to shoot the roll you bring the roll to a film developer, they develop it, and then you get the pictures back. So where I'm taught running with this, with our CPM and some of the weaknesses, well, 
your feedback. So I said, you know, a critical path schedule is often developed, you know, updated maybe every two weeks, but mostly every month. That's a long time to wait. Well, you know what? With film, it was a long time to wait. Actually, Edwin Land in one of his demonstrations. So he was really good. He was, he was one of uh, basically Steve Jobs' mentor. Uh, in the 80s, Steve Jobs would go visit Land, who was then at re in retirement, and seek his advice on different things. And so they became fairly close. Uh, and basically, he was quite the presenter. That was another thing that Jobs uh, picked up. He was quite a salesperson. And so he would, you know how Jobs presented the iPhone and the iPad and had these really big events that he practiced and practiced and practiced for. Land was similar. And so he, when, he, when they first developed that camera and they took the picture and it came out, that was like magic back then, right? It doesn't seem like magic now, but it was magic back then. It's like you could take a picture and not have it done. And one of the pictures he took was of himself, like a selfie, all right? And on the selfie, he got like half of his head and half was missing. And so as the saying goes, he basically said, you get instant feedback. You know it's not done that well, right? And you can take another one because you're at that event. So you take a vent and you're, you know, you're shooting a picture, a photo of something, you're visiting somewhere, taking a photo. It didn't turn out, you know. With the Kodak film, you had to wait several weeks, right, to get it developed. Big difference. Well, critical path. We have to wait a long time for the feedback. But the problem is there's all these other things, moving parts that are happening in between. We need to be able to iterate fast. And so Edwin Land was that fat first aspect of the fast. And then of course the next step was digital. That's where Apple comes in and that's where a lot of the phone companies come in. I remember, not even the phone companies, right? But I remember the first digital camera in the mid nineties and having that and the quality wasn't that great, but the feedback was instant, was fantastic. Uh, that is the difference quick feedback. So whatever, if we're going to successfully manage our construction projects, you got to build in systems, you know, and I'm not here to, in this particular video to just promote lean, but I don't, I don't care whether we're using traditional methods or lean methods. If we're not getting feedback and having systems that allow us to iterate and adjust quickly and to get that information back to the people doing the project work, that's waste. And so we have to look for how to improve. And those are some of the limitations with critical path. Critical path is good in getting us those milestones, getting us the sequencing, getting us a benchmark to measure against. But it's not solving the problem of getting that information out and getting the feedback back in real time as things happen. Okay. And so wherever you're on a construction project, the better you can get that those feedback loops more immediate so that you can make quicker iterations and get information out the more smoothly your project will flow so that's what i wanted to cover today i'm tom stevenson wishing you a wonderful day if you enjoyed this please click the subscribe button check out my playlist i've got whole courses listed on the playlist that you can follow through from beginning to end and that should be helpful and watch those founders uh, podcasts they're really really good Bye for now.